Well, good morning and welcome to the fourth and final installment of our series, Not Today, Satan. This series has been powerful. I know when we looked at fear and the story of Gideon, when we looked at pride and the story of Jonah, and when we looked at offense and the story of Naaman, we begin to see the way that the enemy is working to hinder us from becoming all we can be, from reaching our full potential in Christ. He knows that he can't get us when we are saved nothing can snatch us out of the father's hand by by faith we are by grace we are saved through faith and this not of ourselves it's a gift of god not by works so that no man can boast when the enemy knows that he can't get us what he does is his his next agenda is to get us sidelined on the battlefield like in a football game he wants us only he just wants us on the sideline he wants us on the injured reserved list he does not want us moving the ball down the field for the kingdom he he does not want us making disciples. He does not want us standing in faith. He does not want us to overcome his tactics and to overcome the enemy and the gates of hell. He doesn't want us to live a life of joy and peace and fulfillment. He doesn't want any of those things. So he wants to sideline us and separate us from the will of God so that it kind of just religion and the religious experience is like enough for us. So today, what we're going to look at is his greatest tactic, a tactic that applies to to every single person, because we're moving from the realm of principalities. We've been talking about how these these things that he uses, fear, pride, offense, they're not feelings that I don't feel offended. I don't feel afraid. I'm not just acting prideful. They're actually controlled by principalities, rulers of the unseen realm, by, by Satan's demonic forces, that they have domain, that they have dominion, power, and authority over a certain way of thinking and when you walk into a certain place even geographically or whatever it might be like you can sense sometimes that there's an authority to a certain spirit a spirit of lust a spirit of deception a spirit of greed a spirit of jealousy whatever it might be like you can sense even spiritually when you walk into a place that's not that's because it's not a feeling those things aren't feelings they're states of being that are controlled by the enemy and by the the forces that he sets up, the authorities that he sets up, just like the kingdom of God is ruled by people in different areas that have authority, so the enemy does the same thing. And he has he has de- demons, demonic forces that are leaders over certain areas. And and if you read the book Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis, this is really insightful. He, he wrote that book along the same lines of what I'm talking about right now. And and. God does the same thing. He has dominion. He has authority over different places. So what I want to tell you today is that this fourth and final facet is Satan himself is over this this as a principality. It applies to every other thing. It applies to to pride. It applies to fear. It applies to offense. It applies to, to everything. And that today is temptation. Temptation itself is not a feeling, it's a tool used by the greatest principality of the universe, that is Satan himself, ruled by the prince of darkness. The enemy wants, make no mistake, he wants to steal from you, he wants to kill you, and he wants to destroy you. Now, I don't know if we always stop and wrap our head around what that means, But his attacks, his tactics, they're not trivial, they're not small, they're not menial. It's not a joke when he comes against us thinking that we can just kind of flirt with sin or just play the games that that he likes to play in the head. The Lord deals in matters of the heart, the enemy deals in matters of the head. So if you're wrapped up in your head, you're playing a game, you're dancing with the devil. When you allow the heart to just to just penetrate and to speak and to lead. Now, all of a sudden, you're, you're dealing with the Holy Spirit. He brings conviction. He moves on the heart. He convicts us to, of sin. He, he, he leads us towards repentance. His loving kindness leads us towards repentance. Like the, the love of God stirs within us a desire for righteousness. He moves on us that way. The enemy gets in the head and starts twisting. Did God really say? That's how he plays. He wants to steal from you, to kill you, and destroy you. And he will always start 
with a small little piece of bait, a temptation. Temptation is from the enemy and is intended to keep you from reaching your full potential in Christ. Now, I want to talk real briefly as we get started, temptation versus testing. These two words actually in the Bible are the same word. There's no distinguishing in the Bible between tempting and testing. It's the same word when Satan tempts and when God tests, it's actually the same word that's used. So why in English, we have these two different words, which is helpful in this scenario. Um, why in English do we use two different words? Well, it's based on the, the motivation of the person that is, that is doing the testing. So both God and Satan test. The question is, which one is which? It's based on their motivation. So... Um, Satan, he is bringing temptation for the purpose of tearing you down. And God is bringing testing for the purpose of building you up. The enemy gives you a, a test, a temptation, because he wants you to fail. He's trying to trick you. He's trying to deceive you. He's trying to get you to answer the wrong way and then, and then get you to fail so that you can't move on to the, next, to the next section, to the next grade, to the next course, looking at it in terms of education. God is a good and loving and benevolent teacher, and he knows that you've got issues in a certain area. So he gives you a test in that area, not not for the purpose of making you fail or seeing you fall, but so that you can realize for yourself, of course, he already knows what your test grade's going to be, just like the teacher already pretty much knows which students are, are passing and failing. But he wants for you to see, he wants for you to realize, all of a sudden, I take that test and I fail the test and I'm like, oh no, this is bad. I'm not going to be able to, to progress to the next section, to progress to the next grade. The grade itself doesn't matter, but moving forward in my life matters, moving Moving forward in my faith matters. Moving forward and trusting him more and believing for more and standing on his word and not giving way to the enemy's tactics and the enemy's tricks that are going to draw me down and pull me backwards. God wants for me to realize those things. So his testing is for the express purpose of helping me to realize my need for him and what areas I need to press in and ask the Holy Spirit for more. And then when I become aware of those things, I start seeing them everywhere. And now there's opportunity opportunity for overcome. Tempting versus testing. Temptation is the bait that Satan uses to ensnare you in a deadly trap so that he can destroy you. Every temptation, every flavor, no matter what it might be, is from him. And it's not a small thing to, to steal a little bit of money or to tell a little lie or to look at a little bit of pornography or do this or whatever it might be. Like they, we, they can feel like they're so small. They can feel victimless. They can feel like nobody will notice. You are the victim. It's not another person, I don't want to do this because a bad thing will happen to another person. No, you're giving the enemy a hook in your mouth and he's going to start reeling you in and you're already hooked. You're already snared. Temptation itself is not a sin, but it can lead to sin. Temptation is not a sin, but it can lead to sin. So I'm going to give you today, we're going to go through our four points that we always do um, for this series. But right before we do, I'm actually going to give you the way that the enemy works, the way that he ensnares you and traps you, and how this process um, moves forward and leads through so that you can see his tactics and what he's doing. The acronym TEASED is a perfect acronym for the way the devil works, okay? So here's what happens. First, he brings temptation. The first thing he does is to bring temptation. Now, temptation always looks good. It's always shiny. It's always glittery. It always is attractive. It's going to feel good. It's going to make you, it's going to make you feel better. Like, you know, temptation, it has this appealing nature to it. Temptation is the bait that is on the hook. That fish bites that not because there's a hook there. It doesn't see the hook. All it sees is the thing that it wants. It only sees the bait. So it goes after that bait and then it's hooked. So temptation is the first thing that the enemy does and it's not necessarily a sin. It's not a sin to be tempted. Even Jesus was tempted and we're going to look at that today. But the next thing that happens, and this is sometimes a sin, Sometimes not a sin. It depends on the situation. But then, once we're tempted, we begin to entertain the idea. 
let's just say a, a beautiful woman walks by a man and, and he, it, he sees her and she's gorgeous. God literally made him to be attracted to her. He's, he's physically attracted to her and that's not a problem. It's not sin, to, to, but then when he, he turns away and, and all of a sudden the brain starts to get going, he begins to think of what it might like, be like to, to be with her. Or maybe it's a, another situation where there's um, a person is, is needing money and they're desperate for finances. And so the temptation goes through their mind of, of stealing something. And that itself is not a sin. Then they begin to entertain. Now, now what, what would that actually look like? Like, how would I actually do it? And, and would it really be so bad? Like, it's starting to entertain. The temptation itself is there. It's not a sin. We're all tempted. We're all tested. Jesus himself was tempted in the wilderness by the devil. But when you begin to entertain the temptation... Now you're, you're going up and you're, you're smelling that bait. You're taking a little poke at it. The fish will do this. They'll take little pokes at it before they give a, a big chomp when you're fishing. It's not always a sin. Sometimes it is in the situation of lust. The Bible says don't even look lustfully at a woman. So when you entertain those thoughts in certain fields, you have actually already crossed the line into sinning. But other times you haven't necessarily yet, but you're beginning to toy with the idea in danger, danger, danger at this point. When you entertain, it inevitably will lead to action. It inevitably will lead to acting on those ideas that you have entertained in your mind. And every single time when you cross this threshold, you have committed sin. You've acted on those thoughts. You've acted on those feelings. And and now you've crossed a boundary. Now you are in sin. And the problem here is that you need immediate and swift repentance. At this point... After you've committed this sin, like if you act, if you repent from it quickly, if you make it right with the person, if you bring in your brothers and sisters into accountability with you, like all of a sudden, like you can have freedom. It's, it's, it's pretty easy at this point still to get rid of, of the issue, to get rid of the cancer because of the blood of Jesus and the moving of the Holy Spirit. But if you don't, if you refuse to repent, if you say that was kind of nice and you don't make a turn and, 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 and protect yourself from it for the future and ask for the Holy Spirit's power to overcome, then you begin to develop what's called a stronghold. When you habitually and persistently act on that, that temptation, on the, entertaining those thoughts, and you begin to make it a pattern, now you've developed a stronghold, and strongholds are much more difficult, much more difficult to get rid of. Um, I like to use the analogy that sin is a lot like cancer. In the early stages, it's easy to, uh, to get rid of, but it's very difficult to detect. So if you have stage one cancer, stage two cancer, you can, you can usually get rid of it pretty easily. But the problem is most people don't know that they have cancer in stage one or stage two because it hasn't caused any major issues yet. This is a lot like sin. When you're first kind of entering into that pattern of, of habitual sinning, a lifestyle of sin, um, embracing a certain facet of sinful behavior, it's actually not as difficult to stop doing it, right? To, to repent of it and to turn, but it's hard to do because, it, it, like it's hard to detect because you don't realize what an impact this is having. You don't realize how deep the roots are growing. You don't realize what a, what a serious issue this is going to be and the kind of damage that it's going to cause. And so you just continue to entertain it. Whereas when, when sin gets in the later stages, just like cancer, stage three, stage four cancer, all of a sudden it's very easy to detect because it's causing big problems, but it is very difficult to get rid of. The longer we let our sin go unchecked, the longer we go fighting it alone and not bringing it into the light and having accountability with brothers and sisters in Christ, with mentors, with pastors, with friends, the the longer we go just persistently and habitually sinning, the, the stronger that this stronghold becomes, the deeper the roots grow, the thicker the wall, and it becomes more and more difficult to act in repentance. 
Now, eventually, a stronghold unchecked will lead to exile. And this is where now, not because the Lord has removed his presence from you quite yet, but because you are now unable to hear him. Like you've, you've, you've grieved the Holy Spirit in such a way, you've defied him in such a way that it becomes hard to hear that still small voice. And eventually exile from the presence of God leads to only one thing and that is destruction. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And I want you to remember this acronym, teased, temptation, entertain, action, stronghold, exile, and destruction. Remember these six things so that you know how the enemy works. And what you've got to do is you've got to cut it off at the temptation level before you start entertaining the thoughts and then acting on them and then developing strongholds and being exiled. Nobody thinks that it's gonna happen to them when they're at this stage. In between these two, the temptation comes and they're just entertaining the thoughts, just having a good old time embracing it in their mind first they don't realize that the end game is destruction from the enemy and we all think it's not going to happen to me we have to be quick to repent and don't live in the darkness bring things bring your struggles into the light of people that can uplift you and encourage you and hold you accountable set up fences around around your property guarding your heart so that people, when, when, when they're trying to come in all these different, different ways, different temptations, you have boundaries set up and you know when something has crossed this boundary, this is my plan. I'm going to engage this circle of friends that I have. I'm going to engage my mentors. I'm going to engage my pastor when this crosses this before it gets in the middle in, of my house and is sitting right in my living room and, and going to destroy my life. So, how do we counter temptation at this spot? Well, there is no, there is no better example than Jesus himself. And we're going to look at this from Matthew chapter three and four. And the same four points that we've been looking at, Jesus models for us in countering temptation. Number one, accept your God-given identity. In Luke chapter two, we see Jesus as a small child is in the temple. Uh, his parents are freaking out and they come back and he's like, didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? Already at such a young age, he had identified the fact that his father was his father in heaven. He was a child of God. And he embraced that identity. Later on, he said, if you don't even, if you don't despise your father and mother in, in correlation with your love for God, if you're not willing to sacrifice uh, your, your ideas of who you are on this earth, your representation of the family that you're a part of, to embrace the fact that you are a family, you are in the family of God, that you are a joint heir with Christ, then you can have no part of the kingdom. Like this is the mentality of identity that Jesus gives us. And then again at his baptism in Matthew chapter 3, verse verses 13 through 17, he steps out publicly and, and, and shows his identity as the son of God, embraces it, and, he, and a voice from heaven comes down, this is my son in whom, well, in whom I am well pleased. The dove comes and rests upon him, his identity. He accepted his God-given identity first. Now, then he, Jesus himself Jesus, the Son of God, perfect in, in grace and in truth, never sinned, embraced the refinement. If Jesus embraces the refinement, then you and I have got to follow his example. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, this is wild, don't miss this. Jesus was led by the Spirit. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. God led him, the Spirit of God sent by the Father, led Jesus into the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted, of being tested. God allowed the devil to do what he was going to do to test Jesus and help for Jesus' faith to just be like you could see it right there and even Jesus for himself like to know what is within him because he's fully God but he's fully man at the same time and so through this testing it is revealed to the entire universe really who Jesus is through this story and the Bible says that he fasted for 40 days and he was hungry fasting this period of time his body is is at 
the end capacity of what it's capable of, of existing on without physical nutrients and physical sustenance. And this is the point at which the enemy comes at his weakest um, at his weakest hour. But Jesus has embraced the refinement. He's embraced a physical refinement through his fasting. He's embraced a, a spiritual refinement uh, through standing in this, in this place of prayer for 40 days after entering into and beginning his ministry through his baptism. And, and now the enemy comes and Jesus has to believe for the power to overcome. Jesus is tempted through these, these three temptations. First is, is uh, to turn these, these stones into bread at the end of his fast. And I'm going get, to get into the weight of all of these temptations, but they're so much bigger than just what they seem on the surface. This is what the enemy does. He makes it seem like a small thing, but really it is a huge thing. And so with the turning stones into bread, he's challenging actually um, Jesus' identity and his, his choice to use his power for his own purpose or for the Father's purpose. Because every time Jesus exercised uh, his supernatural power, miraculous power, it was in accordance with the will of his Father in heaven. Even Jesus said, I don't speak my own words, but only what the Father tells me. Like he to be son, to be subject to. Jesus subjected himself, not because he's less than, but but in order to show us what love really looks like, subjected himself, submitted himself to the will of the Father. So if he began to exercise his own power that existed within him on his own authority to prove to everyone, to prove to himself that he is the son of God, then now all of a sudden he stepped out from under the, the covering of, of faith. And, and this would have had incredibly disastrous consequences. And so Jesus doesn't do that. He says, no, 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 man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that, that comes from the mouth of God. And so in that moment, he just, he stands so resolute. And the first words he actually says to Satan is in verse four, but, the, but Jesus told him, no, <laughs> I love that and I use it all the time, all the time I use this. Like a temptation comes and, and immediately, no. Like no, hard stop, hard no. I'm not gonna play the game. I'm not gonna get into the, the, the mind game. And this is what Satan did, right? When he came to Jesus each time, he didn't say, hey, son of God, uh-uh. He said, if you're really the son of God, if you're really the son of God, turn these, turn these stones into bread. If you're really the son of God, then do the, jump, off, jump off of this, this, this ledge into this temple and people will see, they'll accept you as the Messiah. You don't have to go to the cross, they'll just accept you right now. Like he will always play these mind games with you and that's why you have to cut it off at the pass just like Jesus did, his example. First word, when the enemy comes with temptation, first word, no. And then what did he do? He backed it up with scripture. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And from there, he didn't get into a debate. Satan knows the scriptures. He can debate. He, he uses the scriptures against Jesus. In fact, in the next one, uh, the enemy says to him, if you are the son of God, recognize that again, if, if you're, he doesn't even give you the, the beginning, like the core truth that you know to be true. Jesus was the son of God. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. But Satan introduces deception. He introduces doubt combined with little bits of truth. And look what he says. If you're the son of God, jump off of this ledge. For the scriptures say, for the scriptures say, Satan's quoting the scripture. Congratulations, you memorized a Bible verse, but it depends on how you're using it. He twists the scriptures. He twisted God's words. Did God really say that? He says, he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. He's using Jesus' very words against him. Jesus is the word of God. He's God in the flesh. He wrote those words. He said those words. He made that promise. And Satan's now twisting it against him. Satan plays this head game. I'm telling you, don't 
Don't mess with with the logical, like working it. Well, what if this? Well, I think that. As soon as you step into that place, you have already lost because he is far more logical. He is far more cunning. He is far wiser. He's been doing this way longer. We have no chance against him. We have no weapon against him. We have no argument to make against him. We only have the word of God. We have the word of God and it's all that we need in these situations. We either believe that, we believe that he gives us the power to overcome or we don't. So Jesus responded, but the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Not a whole conversation, not getting into the, not having a Bible study, not getting into the nitty gritty of the theology of of things, not having a debate, no. The scriptures say this, Powerful, powerful. And so the last temptation that the enemy brings to him is he takes him to the peak of a very high mountain and shows him the kingdoms of the world and all their glory and says, I will give it all to you, he said, if you will just kneel down and worship me. And Jesus is fed up at this point and he says, get out of here, Satan. He told him, for the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is what Jesus did. Through the temptations, Jesus believed God's word. Jesus believed God's word. And he never entertained the enemy's lies. He didn't mess around. He didn't play. He didn't get into a debate. He stood on the word of God. So simple, so profound, so powerful, all that is necessary. If you don't have a scripture in your head for the things that are your struggles, for your temptations, for the areas in which you've acted upon sin and need to repent, for the strongholds that you've developed in your life, if you don't have a scripture in your head and in your heart for when the devil comes with these temptations, then you are entering into a war, stepping onto a fierce and brutal battlefield with no weapon in your hand. You will be ill-equipped to stand against the temptations of the enemy. He is a master manipulator. He will blindside you. You will never see it coming. And you only have the word of God and the Holy Spirit dwelling within within you, inside of your heart, to stand against him. All of your other tactics, all of your other logical reasoning, uh, you know, all of that stuff, your own brain is child's play compared to what he's going to throw at you. You have got to hide God's word in your heart. Just like the Psalm says, so that I might not sin, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The Bible says we should be meditating on God's law day and night, night and day, talking about it as we, as we walk forward, telling it to our children, tying it on our, on our hands and putting it on our doorposts so that, so that we might observe to do all of that is written and for then he will make our way prosperous and then we will have good success. Then we can resist the devil and that is exactly what happens. If you believe God's word for the power to overcome, then you will see God do the impossible. How can we stand against the enemy? How can a puny little human beings stand against the forces of evil. It's God who does the impossible. The enemy will flee. And at this time in verse 11, the Bible says the devil went away. There's a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse seven. Ooh, I love this verse. It says, it says, the Lord shall cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They will come out against you one way and they will flee before you in seven different ways. The enemy may come against you in one way, but when you stand on the word of God, when you embrace your, your God-given identity, when you believe for the power to overcome, Then, all of a sudden, you've embraced the refinement. You've believed for his power to overcome. Now you get to watch the enemy flee. He comes at you in one way and scatters in panic. In seven different ways, he'll flee. The Bible says the gates of hell cannot stand against the church of God. This is our inheritance. We are the head and not the tail. In Christ Jesus, this is the inheritance of the children of God. 
But it's not by our own power, it's by his power. And you can stand against temptation right on the front, right on the front end, before you're entertaining the thoughts, before you act on it, before you develop a stronghold and are exiled from the presence of God and eventually destroyed like the enemy wants you to be. You can stand against all of it, seeing God do the impossible by simply standing on his word, by simply believing that what he says is true, regardless of who you think you are, the decisions you've made in the past, the shame, the guilt, those are temptations that the enemy is launching against you. He wants you to buy into the shame. He wants you to buy into the guilt, but you stand against him and you say, no, I am a child of God. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life that I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me when you stand on the word of God you have power to overcome the enemy's attacks there is nothing he can do against you no weapon formed against you shall prosper Jesus then goes on in the days to follow to call his disciples one by one. Only a few short days after, he preaches the Sermon on the Mount and goes on to redeem the entire world from the curse of sin that leads to death. Accept your God-given identity. Embrace the refinement. Believe for the power to overcome and watch God do the impossible. I hope this series has been edifying to you. I hope it's lifted you up. I hope it's emboldened your spirit. I hope it's opened your eyes to see the tactics of the enemy. They're not just small things. They're not just feelings. The, the, the fear, the pride, the offense, the temptations across the board, whatever they might be for you, they're no small thing. They are bait that is attached to a hook that is going to pull you into destruction, but you can stand against it by by the blood of Jesus, by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, you have the mind of Christ and the same power that raised Jesus from the grave is alive and active and breathing within you that you are a son, you are a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that you are a joint heir with Jesus Christ and the inheritance that was promised to Jesus is for you just the same. That eternal life is, is on the threshold, is right at our doorstep. And if we will accept our identity in him, if we will embrace his refinement, if we will believe his word and his spirit for the power to overcome, then we will see him do the impossible and we will become legends, generals for the kingdom of God, conquering territory for the kingdom, pulling people into the kingdom of God and standing, defying the gates of hell and the sieges of the enemy just routing hell for the kingdom of heaven may it be so in jesus name may god bless you today and always